Coming up on Small Town Big Deal. How two fine feathered friends created a multi million dollar company using Mother Nature's paintbrush to reinvent the bow tie. Plus, our mind blowing expedition inside the world's largest pipe organ. Oh, it's the most spectacular sound well for here. And meet the doctors of dirt. They dig healthy soil. It's all tied to the soil. Welcome to Small Town Big Deal. You know, anybody that knows us knows we love a good Made in America story. That's right. We found one in Charleston, South Carolina that has really taken flight. <laughs> and its foundation is in friendship and feathers. At first glance, old college buddies Ben Ross and Jeff Plotner don't look much like a couple of trend-setting fashionistas. You went to law school. I did. Yeah, I worked for a healthcare developer out of Charlotte, North Carolina. But today, the two find themselves not practicing law, nor building hospitals. Instead, they've created the enormously successful fashion accessory company, Brackish, based in the not-so-small town of Charleston, South Carolina. Their signature product? These incredible, all-natural, handcrafted feather bow ties. The idea came to Ben back in 2007 when the lifelong outdoorsman was trying to come up with a special wedding day keepsake he could make for his groomsman. <laughs> I happened to lay a turkey feather down beside a bow tie one day and the natural shape, conformation, and tapering of a turkey body feather is triangular, so that was the light bulb moment that that was going to be the gift. <laughs> when you got a bow tie made out of turkey feathers, what'd you think? I thought it was amazing. And I started wearing mine out to other friends' weddings. And every single wedding, I would have six or seven strangers come up to me and talk to me about this turkey feather bow tie that I had on. And I just kind of started thinking, well, that never happens. A few years passed. And then one day... Jeff came to me and he said, listen, I think that this bow tie thing that we did, he goes, I think this is something special. He goes, you want to partner up and do this? And I saw the drive, determination, and vision in his eyes. He just saw where it could go. And I said, I said, sure, I'll make them, you sell them. And so literally in the nights and weekends, I would make them and he'd go door to door trying to sell them. And it's just, it's been just a collaborative, collective effort. You don't get one without the other. He is the salt water, I am the fresh water that makes brackish go. So the name derives from that freshwater, salt water, brackish. Absolutely. The boxes are made out of pine. These old burlap sacks used to be oyster bags, so the pine grows in the fresh water. Burlap was for oyster bags from salt water. So even in the packaging, you have the two elements coming together to create brackish. What started with a handful of turkey feathers has evolved into a company that sells hundreds of thousands of units each year, has over 550 retail partners, and employs nearly 50 people. When was that moment where you guys really were put on the map? One of those times was when Bill Murray presented an Oscar wearing one of our ties. That was one of those pinch me moments. You're like, you're seeing one of our products on the red carpet at the Oscars uh, up there in front of the podium uh, on a, you know, a worldwide audience watching that. It was like, oh my God, this has really happened. <laughs> Plenty of other celebrities from across the spectrum soon followed suit. But to Ben and Jeff, the real stars are the artisans who create all the unique offerings from the company's Charleston Design Studio. How do you find a feather artist? It, it's something that you really have to have that skill set of being intricate, detail-oriented, and being able to just notice these little, little details for an extended amount of time. Each feather type may get separated into six different categories. We sort them from hue, color, size, and sometimes a picture of all three. It just depends on what it is. Yeah, we have over 200 items that we make, so it is uh, very important that we get every feather right. It, it does get difficult. Yeah. <laughs> a woman's collection that includes feather earrings and bracelets was added in 2019. And thanks to Mother Nature, the possibilities seem endless. Where do you get your sourcing at? No bird is ever harmed for brackish to obtain a single feather. That's something we pride ourselves on. 
These are all byproducts of other industry, meaning like your table fare, like your turkeys, your quail, your pheasants, are all birds that are being farm raised to go from farm to table. Then your exotic species are all collected through molt, like your lady amherst, your silver pheasant, peacocks, and things of that nature are all sourced through feather supplier farmers that take the best care of their birds, because if the bird's not taken care of, then the feathers aren't sellable. All of our permanent collection in the men's bow ties are all natural occurring feathers. This is all Mother Nature's paintbrush, and I tell you, her paintbrush is absolutely extraordinary. I understand that Rodney's gonna get to wear one of them. We're gonna strap yeah. up and might maybe get a little dangly for you too. Oh, yeah. Get y'all brackished up. This farm boy from Illinois is gonna don a tux and strut like a peacock. Wow. Hey. Looking good. Y'all yeah, clean up nicely. <laughs> Very we try. Nice. And you're absolutely beautiful. Very stunning. Thank you. You know, I have oh, to say, like your earrings. these earrings make me feel very flirty. Very nice. You know, so, yeah, I like that. I you like wear that. them and well. the bracelet. Let's see the cummerbund. Very nice. Yeah. Is this the first time you've been applauded for your wardrobe? Absolutely, I think so. <laughs> I mean, you get noticed. Men, you will be noticed when you wear this. Women will come up to you and they will want to touch your ties. <laughs> Where do you want to go next? I always say we deal in feathers, so the sky's not the limit. Uh, we, that's where we soar. I think we keep pushing the boundaries of feathers and fashion, and I think we'll continue to do so uh, until we hang it up, which will be a long time. When we come right back. You've never heard or seen anything like it. Inside the amazing effort to restore the world's largest pipe organ. Mm. It takes a lot of air to make that one blow. <laughs> we'll be right back with more Small Town Big Deal. Welcome back to Small Town Big Deal. We are standing on the boardwalk in Atlantic City, New Jersey. And if the huge building behind us looks familiar, well, that's because it was the home to the Miss America pageant for decades. But behind those walls is a hidden treasure, one that is slowly humming itself back to life. That is music to everybody's ears. It's like the soul of the building is being reawakened. Oh, it's the most spectacular sound you'll ever hear. You'll hear nothing like it. It is, without a doubt, the most monumental instrument ever built. The halls are alive with the sound of music as restoration efforts are in progress on this one-of-a-kind mid merlosh pipe organ. It's the largest in the world. Construction began in 1929 and took more than three years to complete. So the organ was officially completed in 1932, but the expenses had gotten so high that it was never actually refined. The organ was a pipe dream come true for Senator Emerson Lewis Richards, who wanted to fill the city's mammoth convention hall with sound. In the entire instrument, there are 33,112 pipes to the best of our knowledge. We just know there's quite enough to make us the world's largest. It literally goes through almost every inch of the building, from the second sub-basement to the roof line, through all the walls, about halfway back in the arena. Golly, it just keeps going. It holds several Guinness World Records, including the loudest musical instrument ever constructed. So many senses come to life as you explore the multi-level maze of pipes that deliver sounds from the highest highs to the lowest lows. Mm. Takes a lot of air to make that one blow. You probably should try that one. Nice. <laughs> so this would actually be 16 hertz, which is below the range of human hearing. But the reason we have these, it's not to be a solo just of this one pipe. It's to add gravity to everything else playing on top of it. How much does this weigh? This weighs 2,300 pounds. So we're going to dip these. Fortunately, into the pipes the we pitch in to help clean are much smaller and made of lightweight metals. And now, even though this metal is probably 95 years old, it looks brand new. When you hear this thing play in person, I know you can't feel it on TV, but it goes through you. It's seven keyboards and more than 1,200 stop keys and knobs would be intimidating to a lot of musicians. 
but Brett Miller is happy to hold the ivory keys to the kingdom. He played this organ for the first time when he was 17, and he was hooked. So you actually, as an organist, have to select which sound you want. So if you want a clarinet, if you want your mini Philadelphia Orchestra. Do you have trumpets? Oh, do we have trumpets? So we can only let you hear a few bars of this one, but you're going to know it. It's just a collage of goodness. <laughs> and helping bring that goodness to life is 92-year-old Brantley Duddy. He's been repairing organs for 75 years, and he let us try to fine-tune a pipe. Now let's see what you did to it. Oh, dear. Better? Better, yes. It needs a little bit more. Needs a little more? <laughs> Volunteers and experts have been working on the restoration since 2015. They estimate it will take eight more years to bring this breathtaking instrument to full life, but they need more than time. So it's going to take about $12 million more to complete the job. So come on, everybody, go to the website, make a donation. Let's get this baby finished. The end goal has always been full restoration, but it seems achievable now. We definitely like the sound of that. Up next, meet the doctors of dirt, farmers finding healthy profits by healing the soil. Naked soil is not good. Welcome back to Small Town Big Deal. We are in the land of 10,000 lakes, Minnesota. You know, I think you could call it the land of 10,000 farms. There are so many here. Farming has been a way of life here for generations. But the way some people farm is changing. It's right on this farm. They believe that the way to healthier food and, well, healthier farms is by having healthier soil. Stony Creek Farm is located near Redwood Falls, Minnesota, about 100 miles west of Minneapolis. Here you'll find the usual, baling hay, harvesting grain, feeding livestock. But there's also a lot of unusual things going on. That's because Grant and Dawn Brightcruits have become experts in the field of regenerative agriculture. Regenerative agriculture to me and Dawn is, the way we try to explain it is rebuilding what we've maybe Degraded. Degraded. Like most farmers, they had plowed and planted the same fields with the same crops, adding lots of chemicals. But it became clear this method wasn't sustainable for them. Financially, 12 years ago, how was the farm doing? Not good. We were, we were really struggling. We were seriously though. considering quitting. Really? Yep. And God said, nope, you're not done yet. <laughs> yeah, I got another plan for you. This is our soil. That plan centered on the health of their soil. You can see earthworm holes. And trying to bring back all the good stuff that used to be in it. We noticed that our carbon levels, our organic matters, had dropped under 2%. And this native prairie here would have been at 12%, so we focused on rebuilding it. And rebuild they did. Well, you don't have a weed out here, though. No, no herbicide. No. As clean as a whistle. The results are staggering. They're harvesting nearly the same amount using 60% less weed killer and 70% less synthetic fertilizer. And once we realized to manage for profit per acre and that we we're managing an ecosystem, things really started to change. It made farming fun again. Yeah. It's just, it's fun again. Could you hear people going pss, pss, pss. Oh yeah, we, <laughs> we heard it. A lot of times right to our face, in fact. There's peer pressure in agriculture. We had to grow some pretty tough skin. But over the years, that has changed. Some of our very skeptical neighbors early on are now implementing a lot of the practices we are. And it's, it's fun to see. And one of those practices is to treat the pasture land like the herds of wild buffalo did 200 years ago. They ate some of the grass and then moved on, trampling the rest. This helped create a skin over the rich topsoil. The skin feeds the biology of the soil. We actually have a new grass plant coming through. But just look at how thick this skin is to protect the soil from wind, so like water. Mulch. Yeah, it's like mulching a garden. 
To keep a healthy skin, you have to avoid overgrazing, so the herd has to be moved often. We determine how much feed they need per day, and we build our paddocks accordingly. Turns out the cows are used to it. All right, let's go. The calves, not so much. Rodney, yours are getting away. Come on up from that side there. <laughs> yeah, TV personalities, they got a lot to learn about herding livestock. Turns out we have a lot to learn about how differently Grant and Don grow their crops. Instead of looking at things critically, you're more open to see all of the positives. We used to wake up every morning trying to figure out what pest we're going to deal with for the day. Now we go out and try to figure out how to encourage more life on the farm. Good bugs versus, Good bugs yeah. versus bad bugs. Yep. Yeah. One difference, they don't plow their land ever. Turning the soil over creates what Grant calls naked soil. Naked soil is not good. When Mother Earth is naked, the first thing she does is tries to cover herself up with weeds. So instead of covering it up with weeds, we cover it up with cover crops. There are a lot of different varieties growing out here. Yeah, this is seven greens all seeded at the same time. They'll all be harvested at the same time. We've got oats, wheat, barley, peas, lentils, faba beans, and flax. All these varieties create feed for livestock, put different nutrients back into the soil, and do a great job crowding out weeds. And just when I thought Farmer Rodney's mind couldn't be blown anymore, we got to the corn. All of a sudden, one day I was out here and I saw that. This corn is producing its own fertilizer, nitrogen. It's happening through strange looking aerial roots that can pull nitrogen right out of the air. So that's not a brace root. That's the plant fixing nitrogen to feed itself right back. That is a game changer for the farmer and for the environment. All the success has been a game changer for their family as well. Now Grant and Don's daughter and son-in-law are part of the farm. We head to the chickens to find out more. So we raise them free range out on the pastures. We tend to run them a few days behind our cows okay. on freshly grazed paddocks. And then they are allowed access to grass and allowed to roam throughout the day. They have a safe place to lay their eggs for us to safely collect them. These free range eggs become part of Cody and Carly's business, Tin Creek Range. Oh, we got ribeyes, we got T-bone, and we got eggs. Leave it to the consummate salesman to try to help out at the farmer's market. I can guarantee you you'll love it. So how often when you buy your beef or your pork can you walk up and talk to the farmer to help raise them? People coming in and asking for a pack of beef sticks is a great way for us to open the door to soil health and water conservation with something simple and delicious that we know that they're going to come back for. Yeah. Yep. Creating healthier soil has been a revelation for Dawn that is very personal. I'm a breast cancer survivor and my mom and my sister and my niece have all passed away from breast cancer and knowing that I have something to do with the health of that food, that's possibly why maybe I'm still here and they're not. So if we can educate people to how closely tied the soil health is to our food health and to our bodies, then maybe that's why we're here. Grant and Dawn, we are glad you're here too. We'll be right back. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Small Town Big Deal. You know, I don't think I will ever look at a feather quite the same again. <laughs> and are you going home with that one? I believe I am. Oh, get out that credit card. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing the world's largest pipe organ coming back to life was remarkable. It is so worth the trip to see it. And Don and Grant, I'm in awe of all they're doing to regenerate soil. It's an honor to know them and recognize what they're doing. I'm Rodney Miller. And I'm Jan Carl. Join us again next week when once again we celebrate the great stories from across America. So where are you taking me to dinner dressed like this? You have to wait and see. Hot dog stand, I'm afraid. If my dad had been a John Deere dealer, you know, I'd have probably grown up liking inferior products. But, 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 <laughs> <laughs> that's not true. John Deere makes it, it's just a going.